Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Dia's Readings in the Contemporary Poetry Series. My name is Megan Whitco, and I am Manager of Exhibitions at Dia. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's reading, uh, which is a very special event for us, as it is our final event um, in this series, or this season, of the Readings in Contemporary Poetry. And it's uh, actually also the final event with Vincent Katz at the helm as our wonderful uh, and fearless organizer. As many of you know, Vincent himself is also a, a poet and he's been curating poetry at Dia since 2010, as well as uh, he's a critic and translator and author of 14 books of poetry and two books of translation. I've had the great honor and pleasure of working with Vincent through the series for the past eight years. And throughout the time he's brought forward um, just an incredible variety and group of poets um, to read at Dia. And it's been truly an honor um, to be present for all those events. I've loved it loved it. Um, so it's been a remarkable series and it's really impacted everyone who's attended and I have no doubt that uh, tonight we're in for a, another very special event. So we are tremendously pleased to welcome our poets for this evening's program. Uh, Tango Aizen Martin, Paolo Javier, Janice Lee, Uche Nduka, and our guest of honor, Will Alexander. Thank you all for joining today to honor Will and to honor his work. And well, it's a great pleasure uh, to have you returning uh, to read in the series at Dia for a second time. Um, so one last note, which is since we're not able to be together in person tonight, just want to share that the chat for this event is enabled. And if you want to drop a note to Will or any of the readers or Vincent, any good wishes or congratulations or just general messages, please feel free to put that in the chat. And uh, we will make sure that everyone uh, sees that following the event. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Vincent to uh, begin the introductions for the rest of the evening. Thank you, Megan, and thank you for your kind words. It's, it's definitely been a pleasure to work with you as well, and uh, I'm sure our paths will cross again. Um, I'd actually like to invite our ten readers tonight and Will to um, turn on your video so we can all be at least visually present as we're in this um, panelist format and not, um, you know, with everyone who's in attendance visible, but we will, we will be here together. And um, yes, I am super excited for this tribute to Will Alexander tonight with the uh, great group of readers that Megan enumerated. And um, I think it's a perfect ending to this season, which has been a season of tributes. We've done tributes to Atel Adnan, Norma Cole, John Godfrey, and Ann Waldman. And tonight's tribute is to Will Alexander. And, and the idea was to, um, to honor someone who has been exemplary in their devotion to the craft of poetry and also to the life of the poet. And I was thinking a little bit about that and, and really how difficult that is to, to, to have that as one's achievement, to be, devote one's life to poetry. It's very difficult. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's quite easy to see who those, who those people are. <laughs> when you just look at, at their publications, their presence in the world, um, their readings, it's, it's quite apparent. And I find that interesting and also inspiring. And I'm glad that they all agreed to this format. Um, and yeah, it, it, as Megan mentioned, it's also my last event that I'm hosting in this series. And I was thinking back to the very first reading that we did when we started this up again in 2010, which was a reading by Taylor Mead and John Giorno. And you know, you might think on the surface of it that these readers don't have that much in common, that being Will and John and Taylor, but um, actually I think they do. And I think what it is, is this um, perseverance in not following a format, whether that be in their, the way they lead their lives, their, their choices in, in, in living, their, their social commitments, and also in their poetry, not surprisingly, like they also show a commitment to uh, finding forms that are not given in the literary landscape. So 
with all the variety that there's been in this series, I think there is a through line. And, um, you know, I've always been trying to bring in people who haven't been in the series before, but it's nice when we can have people who have read before. Will has read before in the Dia series, and also Paolo has. Paolo was in the first year um, reading with John Ashbery. We tried to this pair people at, at that time. It was interesting to pair people you know, someone who was quite established with someone who was younger. And um, I'm sure Paolo remembers that event. It was, uh, it was memorable. And I remember, I remember when Paolo came up, he, he said, it's an honor to read with Mr. Ashbery. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was very appropriate and great. And so it's, um, it's an honor for us all to be here with Mr. Alexander as well. And um, so I'll get going with a short bio of, um, of Will Alexander, and then we'll turn to tonight's readers. Will Alexander was born in Los Angeles in 1948. He's a poet, novelist, essayist, philosopher, aphorist, playwright, visual artist, and pianist. He's the author of 30 collections of poetry and other writing, including Asia and Haiti, Sun and Moon Press, 1995, The Sri Lankan Loxodrome, New Directions, 2009, Compression and Purity, City Lights, 2011, Towards the Primeval Lightning Field, O Books, 1998, reprinted by Litmus Press, 2014, Kaleidoscopic Omniscience, Skylight Press, 2013, Across the Vapor Gulf, New Directions Pamphlet, 2017, a Cannibal Explains Himself to Himself, The Elephants, 2019, and the epic tome that has just been published by Roof Books, the 600-plus page Combustion Cycle. Alexander is a recipient of the Whiting Fellowship for Poetry, the California Arts Council Fellowship, a Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Literary Award, an American Book Award, and the Jackson Poetry Prize. His work has been translated into French, German, Romanian, and Spanish. He's taught at various institutions, including the nonprofit organization Theater of Hearts Youth First, whose mission is serving neglected, at risk youth. And our first reader for this evening is Janice Lee, and I'm very pleased to welcome her. Oh, I wanted to note we were talking earlier before we started that um, there's a, a, a heavy West Coast contingent in this reading, so we've, and it's kind of spread up the coast, which I like. So we've got Will is in L.A. Correct me if I'm wrong, anybody. Tongo is in San Francisco. Janice is in Portland, and Uche is on Bainbridge Island off of Seattle. So just Paolo in Queens and me in Manhattan were holding down the East Coast in this kind of crazy uh, electric storm that we're having, which I feel is appropriate. So our first reader, as I said, will be Janice Lee. Janice Lee is a Korean-American writer, editor, publisher, and shamanic healer. She's the author of seven books of fiction, creative nonfiction, and poetry. Most recently, The Sky Isn't Blue, Civil Coping Mechanisms, 2016, Imagine a Death, Texas Re Review Press, 2021, and Separation Anxiety, coming from Clash Books in 2022. She is founder and executive editor of Entropy, co-publisher at Civil Coping Mechanisms, and co-founder of The Accomplices. She currently lives in Portland, Oregon, where she is an assistant professor of creative writing at Portland State University. Janice, take it away. Thanks so much, Vincent. Um, it's an honor to be here to, to pay tribute to my longtime friend and collaborator, Will. Um, I just, you know, one of the things I miss most about living in LA is our kind of regular conversations in Chinatown. We would just meet regularly to talk about things. Um, so I'm happy to be here. 
I'm going to just read a very short excerpt from uh, The Sky Isn't Blue, and it's part of an essay um, that begins with a conversation um, that I had with Will. So this is coming from that. There it was under the blue sky, the birth and death of mother. It was mother's ghost bearing the rain who came to speak of sorrow. When one does not know to abandon her children, she does not know the embrace of death. Haunting isn't for the dead, but for the living. Be prepared for the sea to be your confession. Still, almost fearlessly, she stood there, mother. I recall something that Will Alexander says during dinner. We're talking about the state of the world, about cosmic energy, about the apocalypse, about everything that is already here, about boxes, and about the weather. We discuss all the things that writing seems to be about these days, how petty some of these things seem to be. He remarks about how it's petty to write simply about love affairs, for example, that the only thing writing can be about now is weather, not love affairs or love affairs through the weather. I think about the rain and the heat and that indeed nothing seems more important than the weather, that even with everything that is happening, it is the weather that will outlive us or destroy us. I think about the howling state of the world. Don't things seem more chaotic than usual? Don't things seem calmer, more serene? Doesn't it all feel a bit haunted to you? I mean, I don't see how we can live in the same world and I can feel all of these things and you can't. Where do our worlds overlap these days? I feel increasingly distanced from you and I'm not sure what this means. Ocean Beach Pier at night recalls a certain image. I always remember one particular night when it was red tide. And so the incoming tides and subtle movements of the water revealed a strange and eerie glow the small but numerous bioluminescent dinoflagellates causing the water to glow blue. The same night, the pier was full of people fishing, different colored glow sticks tied to the ends of their lines for visibility, and amidst the already eerie symphony of light and darkness, the fireworks from SeaWorld started to go off. I'm somewhere else, I thought. It was utterly chaotic, all of the different lights and people and flopping fish and voices and boom boxes, and it was utterly beautiful and calm. The darkness, the glow, the perfect home for ghosts and their sorrow. When Mother spoke out loud, the first word was blue. Blue was the color of a confession given under the sign of the fish. Swimming wildly under golden glints of sunlight, the fish only knew to embrace the sorrow. Sorrow is mother is the utterance of an embrace that is the color blue. Can't you feel it with your eyes, the intensity of its sorrow? Only when you encounter death and its embrace can you feel the sun setting behind your eyes. At the end of the pier, it is like I am standing at the end of the world. Standing on the southern tip, there is only darkness and infinity and black and tiny hovering stars. If I stand in the right position, the lights of the city don't even exist anymore, and I can consider the pain of infinite time. Frankly, fear is relieving, and only God knows what it all means, but it isn't difficult to simply turn around and be back in that parallel reality again. This is the ocean that can swallow you whole without flinching, without anyone noticing. You could disappear, you could disappear into the blackness, and here no one would ever notice. Is this a similar kind of loneliness to the terrifying solitude of outer space? Dust and dust and dust of being, of darkness, a kind of black that swallows intimacy and charges one with cruel indifference. You have confessed to me that your greatest fear is being alone. I wonder why we are allowed to live. Don't you realize that it's always leading up to this one moment of death? Hear the caw or beckon of a bird, hear a creature's wound. The wound is the only language that is understood by mother. Glory is the sun, is the fish's stomach embracing the eyes of death, or the sorrow is only known when death is a ghost behind your shoulder, that blue embrace. Feel with your eyes, and death might already exist at the bottom of your stomach. I told you already that it would be easy to change, if not for the wound of blue.
Thank you. Thank you, Janice. That was a beautiful setting. I feel like I got the whole visual and environment of where you and Will were. That's a great way for us to start. Thank you so much. Our next reader will be Uche Nduka. Uche Nduka is a poet and essayist. He's the author of 12 volumes of poems, of which the latest are Living in Public, Writers Collective of Christania 2018, and Facing You, City Lights Spotlight Series 2020. His writing has been translated into German, Italian, Dutch, Finnish, and Arabic. He presently lives and teaches in New York City. Uche, over to you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Vincent, for the invitation to be a tribute to Will. Uh, I came across uh, Will's work when I was living in Europe. Europe. That was, was around 2006, 2005. Um, and right, right from the moment, moment I read his works, it meant, meant a lot to me. You know, I discovered that I had a lot to learn from him. From him. And I wanted to use this particular forum to say thank you, Will, for the inspiration. He, he writes, writes as, you, as you said, no, he writes, writes, he paints, uh, uh, he, he makes, makes music. music. And, and if he's somebody who is a deep reader of his work, all these different art forms are seen within the purpose. Purpose. Yeah. And the works are very, very inclusive. inclusive. Open-ended, Open but inclusive. inclusive. And I admire that, that as a writer. writer. There is also a job, by the way. That I feel like I've seen this a lot of recent works, but there's a job in Will's work. And, and um, that, that moves me. me. I think I that think these days it takes courage to be joyous. So I so have my courage, courage too, too as a writer. Right. So for the evening, I would like to uh, read <coughs> from, from the volume published, published by City Lights, Compression and Purity. I think Compression and Purity. I just read three points from there. The first one is titled The Devil of Formation. If one believes oneself as success, there exists no city age, no neutral density, or scale. One then suffers as a pointless animal's legacy, as a slug ink from a podium, or a tree One comes to know the mobility as a craft. As an art which sold itself to specifics. Yet, to no one's non sophisticated, true mundane advancement as doorway or basic habit as speculation, I am speaking of chastisement or cross referential superimposition within this condition. I am more like a crow from crucial on the world wide. A crucial on the world crawl. Neither Chinese or Shinto, but of the black dimensionality as hid in the water mass, which possesses by bearing, could seem as a sort of a purposeless kinetic or a pointless manual of reflection. Saying such, I consider myself a ready Shinto crawl. Then, then a struggling, a black anatema crawl. crawl. Then, just, just as quickly, quickly a sunfed crawl from, from, from snow, snow washed book and 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 So, I, I look to myself, myself as winter, winter as inclement, carrying momonga, as flat, true bread, literary haze. haze. I, I am being God who shaped the empty wind. Who invokes with God, who, who is still in his forces, stunning psychic transference. And the and second poem is, is uh, uh, if you want to call it a poem, what is it called? called? called Anti-Biography. Anti <laughs> from from the same book. book. On Anti-Biography. Anti -biography. For me, biography, biography is a lantern, lantern 
born in, in the midst of paratentical opaqueness. In a sense, it is a rose, a fantastic meandering, bright or dim, according to the collective understanding of terror. Me, I be seer in a manner, in an image of rural women and a parallel power spawned from curious seismographic mode. I say curious because the original stalking has disappeared into, into the wilderness of an actual blizzard, which gives birth to a new level, level, like, like a total of fire, fire conjoined with the lightning field of the mystery. mystery. I call it the poetic guardian dog. The heriatic alien, alien wing. wing. It is the non-local field, the non-particle non acid, acid, flowing into, into my cognitive iodine rays, into, into the vicious fires of, of my parental matches. So, so, I dance, I dance with vibration, with, vibration, with the solar arc spinning backward, around the miraculous thoughts of a double green horizon. Simultaneously, I escaped the territorial, while well, remaining well, within the bundle of, of, of my own momentary seizures. Gathered by fans, let flow land, the, the face and the mind, mind guided, guided by, by stars. stars. So, so, I'm a matter of real, of space of specifically more plot, Casting at times, a mist, mist, mist as in mirage, mirage, a mist or a mirage, mirage. like a caravan of yas, transporting tongues and, and water. water. Congressly, Congressly, to give to a grant of days, days, to single out a baby, baby of personal social relations, would invite me, would turn me around a diurnal bundle of glass, staggered with a length and final impression. Partially not my, my sensitivity to follow the phonemic epipers. To the inclination towards the victory with bonds in the dawn above the head. head. For me, this is the green of hell. hell. The pleasure of an eternal solar essence. essence. Glinting, full of fabulous maelstrom diamonds. And empowered the hero of, of dreams. Of claustrophobic grand spectrums which they made themselves, themselves and returned return to themselves. themselves. Like, like Ivan and may go out and return to itself, so, so that, that this power, power transmutes trans trans by, by, by the very energy, energy of, of his lobby. lobby. And, and I, I think, think of myself, myself the power of sending signals into the mystery and having them return to me on their wings and spirals. So much so. That, that I forget, forget my prosaic locale with his taught by my anchors, with his familiar doctor and image of us, with his days in crying in trapped in his own faces. I am only concerned with simultaneity and height, with rays of the nonomial kindling, guiding the new cottage through ravens into the ecstasy of x rays. And, and blackness. And the and last one from, from there is called Alien Personals. Inside this one world through a sort of hall, there is a form of reptile optic, like, like a cold and in the sun, sun which must advance through the endless interior of offerings. The gods are the gods of managers, of calibrous politics, of intermittent personnel, dissolving themselves beyond the chaos of reason. And so, those personnel of the whole committed to forms of alabaster summits of hell, of quivering reception of the condensed by a giant galactic animal tied to an, to an obvious, obvious state of, of memory, implanted, implanted in his heart by a level, level of, of charisma over and beyond the zodiac. 
In I read a poem from a book of mine called Say the Real One. The all of title. So I just read from page 10 to 12. What would have happened if Plato forgot Socrates? Suffering sucks. Why do you expect praise for it? Connect the dust, then the end of my They are living some sleep in the stars. Their pocket is wet to be picked. Both hands put up into an upper section of my mentee. Flick out completely when you are done. In the daylight, I think about the likeness of fucking to itself and nothing but itself. Does it matter if the sun doesn't rescue me anymore? Does it matter which way I turn? A thinking window is looking for me. I ride my bike beside you. Was it with eternal verity? I punish my one of my manship. Trash picker, real class simulacrum. And he moans, I don't hail him. As nasty as he gets, you beauty please. Little savage with tongues, raging. Starting all over with the moment of untruth. I think I will stick around with the crack, screwed up from obnoxiousness. Add me to your merry list. Intro, met for a day in your half. Stop the pause on the hardness. A sort of wild adulation. Acting in rule, expecting me to get naked with you. Juggling in this car, the rules that bind me to your delight. Where do my pedigrees begin? My killers are on the wall. I uttered my memories of lost connections. Once in a blue while, blue shades do catch a hint of the shadow of the cabinet. Begonias, black hats in the dust. Tony to Ophelia's cross. Part hard, part lived. Death is not supposed to be in the neutral. I have seen better days, and they were going nowhere. Sometimes I have spotted the dawn in my skirt, a mini skirt. Could cry and fire his cape into my bell and scream. Do not shake for sweetness in this guillotine. Thank you. Thank you, Uche. It's a beautiful reading. I loved hearing your your poetry together with Wills and the the music that you brought to both. And I liked what you said about um, I think a sense of humor you said or a joy that is uh, in Wills' poetry. I think that's important. Thank you. Thank you. Our next reader will be Paulo Javier. The former Queensborough Poet Laureate from 2010 to 2014, Paulo Javier has produced three albums of sound poetry with Listening Center, David Mason, including the limited edition pamphlet cassette, Earlier Aclopolis, and the booklet cassette, Maybe the Sweet Honey Pours. He's the recipient of a 2021 Rauschenberg Foundation Artist Grant and a featured artist in Greater New York 2015 and Queens International 2018 volumes. His next book of poetry, OBB, AKA The Original Brown Boy, is a weird post-colonial techno dream pop comics poem that includes illustrations by Alex Tarampi and Ernest Concepcion and will be published by Nightboat Books in the fall of 2021. Paolo, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Vincent, and thank you so much, Dia. It's great to be back. Um, I'm so honored to be participating uh, amongst amazing poets. Um, and uh, I guess my fellow poet laureate Tongo in San Francisco, correct? Um, and I'm also a huge fan of these poets. Uh, will, uh, I'm really indebted to you in so many ways. I think just initially my introduction to Will's work was through the late and great poet and 
one of my great mentors, Leslie Scalapino, who published Will's book, um, Towards the Prime of Enlightenment Field. And um, that book really just gave me a lot of permission to, um, I guess, continue in the direction that I was going, which I felt was nowhere and somewhere. But also um, I felt um, a, a tremendous kinship uh, in your work, which I, I guess draws from your own words, inner lingual voltage, a voltage not unlike the powers of lightning or water. And um, I, I can't tell you enough uh, what a delight this is for me to be part of uh, this reading, paying tribute to you and to your new book, um, which I uh, hope to uh, read briefly from. Um, in tribute to Will, I just thought I'd read um, a short sonnet from my last book, Court of the Dragon, which is similar to um, the combustion cycle, um, is interested uh, in esoteric wisdom and drawing from the different energies of the earth. Uh, and uh, I'll just read uh, the fifth sonnet of a cycle that uh, I made in the wake of Hurricane Sandy and I dedicated to uh, Frank Lima. Darkness before dawn, the color real, emperor tomato ketchup. All I miss will encompass the language conjured by this poem. Congregation, why states must go in case of fire, raise guardian silence. Inside alley of fear leans a horizon, equip, treble. I reorganize in face of brute despair, no aversion litany. A lost set arrhythmia, rope lasts a day addiction mild, lenient horizon to you too. No lives to fear denizen lead querulous in the court of the dragon, we lay out our case, dance unchained limb celestial elegy, entrances the dawn stabilizes, winters are hardest, I'll abandon, pause, wanders. It's easy to believe I can sing without largesse, Soul, immerse, nuisance, impudence, infinitive. Voices roll, streets through rusty cage like lottery acid. And uh, if I may will, I'd love to uh, read from your opening sections of your new book. And I can't encourage folks enough to order their copy. I think it's already available. So that's a great and really vital work. And so this is from the opening section concerning the henbane bird. I'll do my best. Poison, the mystification by poison, no. But life as seminal cladistics, not prone to involuntary slumber or to the eye of measurable destruction, but the equidistant barrier surmounted as movement through centripetal transparency, like a flask of mirrors as centigrade in rotation. I exist as incessant cylindrical magenta inside my black vertiginous eye, never ceasing to vibrate so that I am diaphanous, transpicuous, less given to accessible opalescence or distortion by skyography. As I hover inside the Andes as the fuel of an interior lightning subspecies, as an arc, as a sun on a tremorous ruby, not being subject to tribes or genera or toxins. Being the shamanistic hill star, I am nevertheless subject to an iridescent shrillness, to a faultless hurricane taxonomy, being the flight that is vaporous, cleansed, and undividable as transfusion. My molecules, ghosts, my genetics in abstentia of the avions, I am the pre-existing hill star not collapsed into form. I am obscure and proto-endemic as voltage, like a sun minus saffron as weight aligned with the first volcanian satellites rising from ghostly eruption. They are three in number, never subject to calendrical zones, the continental weight. I am sunless, according to the scribes who've poured over texts in Chaldea, who've negated various weights of salt according to sound by inverse rotation, according to mountain chains, according to various beasts born before gravity was founded as law. Thank you so much and uh, Mabuhay Will Alexander. 
enjoyed that hearing that uh, sonnet for Frank Lima was like an old friend. Just it resonated like a classic. And um, and then of course hearing the uh, opening of Will's book was fantastic. Thank you. Our next reader will be Tongo Eisen Martin. Originally from San Francisco, Tongo Eisen Martin is a poet, movement worker, and educator. His latest curriculum on extrajudicial killing of black people, We Charge Genocide Again, has been used as an educational and organizing tool throughout the country. His book titled Someone's Dead Already, Bootstrap Press 2015, was nominated for a California Book Award. His latest book, Heaven is All Goodbyes, published by City Lights Pocket Poets series in 2017, was shortlisted for the Griffin Poetry Prize and won a California Book Award and an American Book Award. His forthcoming book, Blood on the Fog, is being released this fall in the City Lights Pocket Poets series. He is San Francisco's eighth poet laureate. Yay. Welcome, Tongo. Thank you very much. Above the human nerve domain. To unlock predisposives in carbon, to cancel sleep as pyretical drachma, not as transaxial summa, or intense aboriginal invasive, but as promenade, as forgery by craft, as soiled apparitional anagram, yes, as a dark stochastic wheat drained of its magic as drift being boundary, being hellish invention as grasp. I'm thinking of aroused electrical blockage of human monsoon killing as treaty, as breach, as strangled impulse by identity. I mean, the psychic root, which is stained by dialectical illness, by the thought contained in black ozonal mirrors, where general slaughter is reflected, where the mind impels its wits by black molecular isolation, by stunted mangrove withdrawal, by absence from the light, the life of euphoric solar trees, such prone negation imploded from the realms of a suicide foundry of broken wisdom as diamond. It is an eon of fallen snow in a well, an injudicious barrier gone awry, the ingrained Eurocentric example of the hatred of the darker integument with its combative belligerence against the core of relational mystery. So what concerns me is a yoga which implodes the sun, which compounds its runics the body then electric like a stunning sapphire serpent with the arc of its cells alive as interior alter species as an eye of analogical waters, no longer of anwi, of the praxis of perfidious helium atrocity extended by the vapor of betrayal by the dazed imperceptives in the molecules here in such preternatural enclave. I swim in the murmur of sun dogs of kindled potentant spasms like interior distillation from Moorish pre-Copernica, as if at the height of comedic day there existed the dauntless Sphinxian ge geometries, those pre-existent personas of lightning no longer of the form of gravity as bastion of lingering ammonia in the genes, but of absent chemical flaw, the body becoming the magic flight of a transmuted chorion of the bell of a bloodless liminal amber. Our perfect confidence in the sun, in commemoration, every tambourine a thousand miles in every direction playing in a California rent party. Rattlers dancing and bleeding over guys now white in the skin, waiting for the cornfield to shrug. We are forgetful, but your ancestors nevertheless. Slowing down the poems to the speed of sweet light, the speed of bedless deaths, the bones of fast friends near a pile of first fruits, a pile of imperialist failings. Oppressor and oppressed give their guns the same nickname. Underground working class sorta of goes back to school, sorta of studies revolution. 
The summer belongs to itself now, as does the sharecropper's God, as does the death mass, real advice from Malcolm, real rose cords over my Memphis skeleton, a tenor part before dying, playing to our waning blood pressure, our penny plated gun, the last of the space time tut. White people with a soda standing naked on anything. Sold us off a huge garden crystal or peacock feather. Would have sold us off a stack of doo-wop records if they could. Would have sold us off the perfection of the cosmos. Forestry of drug paraphernalia, suburb spikes in the grass, syringe jungle like a sick bed, sick bed execution needle that became a society's bottleneck. Preamble, news talk, or nuclear scientists thank for their work. Activists who don't scream black power, rather black component. A painful season, season gone sentient and well-dressed, taken as a whole, taken in puppet skin, a sentient Sunday that married 15 sticks of dynamite. We are houseless now and dancing our waistlines into a courtroom floor, Atlantic Ocean, throwing my voice into the city weeds, city weeds of the other, other confederacy. I would double down on this poem on this gang friendship, signs of apocalypse in all directions, I would run this poem into the ground. On my fifth skip meal today, Lord, we become even better friends, dollar store notebooks in a mass context, pen cap full of bullets. California color line is played out with necro protest types who sleep on the other, other earth. While we are waiting to shoot on a muralist behalf, this waiting to shoot an old man's truancy of sorts or a tear stain on a panther pamphlet, houseless bookseller speaking about little Bobby the Conqueror, a crisis of open air corrections, chemical extradition and war songs wearing off around the corner from South Texas, you pretended that prison is a river. You married your American cop, black skin, white mantras, like normal speed bullets changing a normal life, like walking back to the United States in defeat. Thank you. Thank you, Tongo. It's great to hear that piece. Beautifully read. Well, um, so now we'll turn to Will Alexander himself, who will be reading some of his own work. Um, I had this, I'll, I'll read a short statement I wrote about, about Will's work. Um, but as I was thinking about it, there's something that always remains mysterious about his writing to me. And I just asked, I had to ask him this question. So I asked him, how did he become a poet? And he wrote back to me, he said, um, not one definitive instant, but a welling up due to the inner foreshortening I experienced through my contact with conventional lingual reality. Poetry has been a lifelong lifting of its burdensome weight. Will Alexander weaves streams and strands of thought and visuals into a soundscape that provides relief, but no escape from the maelstrom of human abuse. The social is firmly locked into the planetary in Alexander's worldview. He's not held by any given era or momentary presence. The loxodrome could be a pathway to the myrmidons or jackals in Alexander's poetry. A hallucinatory incantation raises spirits in defense of long abused ways of living human, plant, and animal. An exploratory sense too of the universe, not to be buckled down by this or that story of ethers across the void. Vallejo imbibing dualities that are not binaries, compression and purity, combustion and leakage, Asia and Haiti. A flow and lull of the greatest moment he exhorts us to bring our own vastnesses, to sidestep ignorance and pursue whatever knowledge momentary glimpses on our traveling planet allow. He clears out a space for poetry where listeners can come into a communal air. Please welcome Will Alexander. I'm gonna thank everybody for appearing today. And of course, uh, being in this, within this circle of brilliance is always inspiring for me on a protracted scale. And uh, what I'll do is I'll start reading from this particular compression and purity, but I won't read the same poems that uh, 
Mr. Nduka did. But uh, this is uh, called coping prana. It is the way I breathe through chronic terrifying ferns, through a black ungracious stoma. It is this uranium rejoinder, this impact pointing backwards. And when witness causes observers to panic, to blur and forget and to flee. They can't see my approach, my wayward dorsal looming, my lettering and black drizzle. It is my approach, my weaving, my sigil is curved embankment. Therefore, I can never name myself or plot myself according to the sparks or the splinters from the workbench. Dazed, ruthless with salivation, with my awkward insular roamings, I am like a few darkened eagles riveted against the moon. Then I'm brought to a table by deafness, feasting with herons, which spins me by embranglement, by incircular abatement, always seeking to have me neutered beneath my derma so as to talk to myself, so as to cancel my structureless scrutiny. They speak of me as lawless, as despicable, as a typhoon in the sea well, as to morals, as to fixed and scattered combination. They fix me as deserted, bereft, as a fragment from a starving lion's compendium. I am considered as pointless positron without image, as hieroglyph, as sundial, as martyr, being leakage from a barbarous index province. So I'll continue here from the same volume. Um, compound hibernation is the name of this particular writing this piece, those who glance about me, who cease to see inside the sun, who cease to imagine its destabilized pre-quanta cannot know me, cannot know my ethos as pomace, as mingled apparition or flare. My perception through the prior sun that I ingest like a blackened pre-existence or collected hawks through assignation. The sun, with its dualisms, with its prebiotic photons which waver. Perhaps nine suns before the sun ex existed, before the ocean seemed formed, there were molecular drafts, Akashic precursors, floating proto-ammonia. I think of carbon and wisps and floodings, a feral, feral combat shelter where blank geometry accrues, before a separable biology was born, before the contradictory ballast of the existent protozoa. Being scorching photon by abstentia, like a pre-atomic sigil, destabilized as blizzard, a precognitive rotation, a strange galvanics of the cosmos. And because of this galvanics, one reeks of invisible tremor, walking around in league with daunting helium affliction. Thus, the mirrors in my skin seem like haunted salamander fluid, like cells bereft with cooling centigrade rotation. Therefore, I know the abyss as volatile lunar transposition, as subliminal mantis, as climbing, as splintering. Therefore, I am not an oily, a blasphemous yogin, collapsing by default, by sudden anger or water. Yet, yet I am composed, struggling with scattered mental arrhythmia, with partial psychic aphasia, intensive, elusive, aloof by interior compounding. I uh, want to continue with the uh, 2009 volume, uh, the Sri Lankan Loxodrome. And this is a, uh, when I start writing at times, I start out from that, that Bretonian idea, not ideologically, but understanding that you just start putting marks on the paper. You don't prescribe yourself as to what you're going to do. You got to trust yourself. It's like the great innovators. I always talk about the great Booker Little, whose name is very rarely mentioned. He was a great trumpeter who played with Eric Dolphy and John Coltrane. And had this great 
philosophy that I, I read, it was just about whew, less than 20 lines about dissonance making the sound grow larger. Great wisdom, you know, and man was passed away 23 years old. But, you know, it's not about age. It's about what you have inside of you in terms of balance and understanding and foresight, insight, I should say, and foresight. But, you know, the thing is to have that kind of maturity internally that I'm, I'm grateful to be surrounded by that type of maturity. And it just happens in life. It doesn't happen after you've gathered a whole spectrum of, of credits. It doesn't happen like that. It's nonlinear. It just happens. It's like, like I feel the same way that I felt at any point in my time. But, you know, you have to mature and, and, and work with your craft, not in a superficial way, but in an internal way, the way you can script your own balance. And so what I'm doing here is trying to just uh, still continuing to script my own balance. But it's not something that, you know, as I said, accrues by you know, linearity or kind of any kind of craft as such. But this is called the Bedouin Arc. And it's from the Sri Lankan Loxodrome. Repetition as the existence, as condoned and respun vapor, which continues to post exist as mirages across an arc, as a lucid underwater scent. An arc with its compression of oars with its one simultaneous ascent over and above the simultaneous as movement. It's obliterated form where the body of the captain reappears and disappears, eruptive with schisms and salts, eruptive with cobias, banquillos, and starfish, extrinsic and solstitial to any forewarned destination, to any leprosy or rupture or fragment, an arc, with at the same time betrayed and withdrawn through an index of phantoms, like a squall beneath a stunning alabaster tide, invigorated by pre existing persons within its hull, spawned by a runic simum calendric, by fields of gnarled lava, predaceous orange brown spider crabs feeding in diametrical coldness. The ark, now again invisible to itself, amidst volcanic flamelets, fanning anonymous blades of crushing underwater jade. The wind around its hull, a void of pusillanimous optometry, a, scale, a shell of scorched bottoms, a mechanics exponentially concussive, like a solitary benzene or an earthquake phylum or a riddle scorpion typhoon. Because this arc, captained by scaleless ghost, stripping the, their foundations from methane, from a sound within a stinging pottery of nerves. Like murmurs from a hatchet well, scribbling maps, inducing subtractive protein on chemosynthetic shock waves of vertigo. So in the depths, a bioluminescence, a void, a glassy conduit of ore, a propulsive cilia, a whip-like chimera, the captain scripting these events in a geomantic log concerning the brackish flare from his burning central body, a body below creatrix waters, a body below the simulation of the trilobites. So that there constantly exists a smokeless anti-existence, which seemingly enshrouds a multiple quantity or a glare much in the form of a stock nucleic food stock, like a summed explosive strife, which is a terra incognita, the fearful archeology span of fate. The ark failing to illumine its former maritime amniotic by means of any pur purposeful or magic diarthosis, or any of the perplexing tonics of salinity, of salinity or by the Gorgonian as former body by persona, be it the pelvic whale or the caudal dolphin, the body of the captain, a blank indeterminate ether, a smoldering solstice phantom, a soma beyond the depth of his former viewing range, superseding di the, the diameter of boron. In the arc, in the arc of the captain, 
conflagrant as anti-causality, which post-exist disintegration. The captain in possession of colorless Bedouin's blood, complex burning, igniting light by carbohydrates. Then just as quickly creating mass in a hydrozoic sea by means of insinuous noctiluca inside the fire of diaphanous algae. The captain, as voice of the dinoflagellates, as interior transpicuity, now as translocated ember as photonic veteran archery with a sudden grasp of stunning neural ranges, electrokinetic and spectral with maturity. He who now thrives without name floating throughout inverted lightning hills. Perhaps his darting appellation is hexagrammidae or a goatfish burin or a form which takes form within Peruvian garuas. At the level of a subdivided spheroid, yet no longer partaking of the disagram or the kentel. In an unknown zone, such as the German East Pacific or Dutch Borneo Peninsulas, like dark imaginary climates, floating beneath a fragment of broken imaginal isles, drifting beyond the confines of nodes or pharmaceutical calculus, gathering incandescent distance in a zone like Lake Ormia or in the powers of Coco Noor. No longer of the realm of geometrical Sirocos, of a prone and caustic emblematics. The world now fallen into a cryptic bay of moons, far beyond the connivance extracted from the comma of the Paraguay rivers. Not a gnomic projection, nor a day's submission to funeric engulfments. The captain no longer of an ashram of vectors or a typographic geyser in a void. He exists at nervous solitary limit. His former vibrations, obliquitous, vulpine, indigenous to the moisture of flashes. The Bedouin arc, an exploded viral dove, a predacious anti-fixation, disappearing at the level of the leucosilinius. Then the, Cecil, then the sea wasps, the Cecil medusas, the hydrozoan jellyfish, like obliterated bells, like the eye in depolarized coronas, seeing susurras, seeing fire in the form of entangled isolations, in the arc of a neuron, in the spark of a dark infinity. Of course, these, these, are, these are works that never prefigured but you know they come from one's application to one's own intensity, one's own private intensity. Because you know, as I read today, I'm I'm not thinking about an audience, but of a passion of something that comes and wells up. And I'm involved in work all the time. All the time, it's like a circle. All the time, it's continuous circle. It's circle. It's like. Having witnessed Sonny Rollins play one time, you know, he's just circular breathing, Roland Kirk, circular breathing, you know, this continuous motion all the time. And the motion creates intelligence and, and, and insight and stability that, you know, I learned from Cecil Taylor, just, just continuing to move and to continuing to work. And as Booker Little said, don't, we, there are no mistakes. So I work with that idea, you know, where it's not a bifurcated, where I got a bifurcated world where I got to check on myself. So I don't check on myself. And I'll read another smaller poem from uh, the um, Sri Lankan Loxodrome. In a lorikeet cave, motions exist of disintegrated swans in a translocated lake brimming with harvested poisons sealed by corruptive postmortems. Such swans staggered by microbial reasoning, their aggressive nest anatomical with anomaly, with drifts of strenuous incarnadine meanings, with a thirst which hurdles conspiratorial invasives, alive with coronal oceanics, open like a clouded trail of rendings. Analogous with the ox, the pelicans, the mergansas, perhaps with the petrels and the gannets 
under the power of darted mocking orations. The swans, looking back on solemn blood perusal like a form of death breaking roses on a shore. It is the example of phonograms of lost and compacted lenses turning within a charismatic fall line or an isonef or what an avian would announce in Greenland as a catabotic wind. The swans, like a haze of magnetism or imploded, implied gondola locations where the scent of each lorikeet is consumed and brought to dazzling eclipse refulgence. In another foci, in another depth, their form self-challenged in a cloak of suns. Their power de-revealed with seven moons burning, reduced to two intense incendiary magnets. And these incendiary magnets lack a nexus of phantoms scattered across the geometric optometry. You know, what I do with writing, I'm in this, what I consider to be a river of poetry. And the hearing is alive all the time. You always, are, I'm always hearing something all the time, intensely hearing at all moments. And sometimes it, it's very difficult to write things down when you're walking or driving a car. But I'll, I'll it, sometimes it gets so intense where, where I'll, I'll just scope in my mind where uh, my next pause can be. Maybe it's a stop light or stop sign just to scribble something down because it's, it's as Eric Dolphy says, it's in the air, it's gone. You can never capture it again. So I just got through exercising this morning with new work and um, I'm just coming down all the time. And it, it's nonstop and it, it's not like I said for an audience as such, but um, it's like that old idea, you put something in a bottle and it washes out to sea and somebody picks it up on another shore. So uh, that kind of work has been, you know, one doesn't have to promote poetry in other words, it's a power in the work itself. It's, it's not where you gotta put an advertising campaign out there for yourself. So I don't say that in a romantic sense, but in a natural sense that it works. But it does, you gotta have a lot of patience. You gotta, gotta what people consider to be losses, you gotta take losses in the, in the transactional sense. To overcome the transactional for me is, is, is what poetry is about. So this is, this is a poem, obviously one of the pieces I wrote in the com combustion cycle. And by the way, this, this was composed some time ago. And I, what I do is I let work sit, age like wood or wine, and it works. You don't want to, as Borges once says, you don't just don't want to rush things into print. You just don't want to do that. But you don't want to rush yourself. Let it happen. But in the world that we're living in today, it's always a, everything's in a rush and to show your, your immediate competency. But... Sometimes, sometimes a, a loss is better than a victory in, in these circumstantial conditions because it spurs you to deeper, deeper points within yourself. You have to get to that point. It's a kind of a maturity where you don't just want to jump the gun, just jump the gun. But it's a test really to, to, to withstand yourself and to, to go through yourself. And so I don't want to take uh, all the uh, time here, but I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to attempt to read this, some pages from the combustion cycle. It's a, uh, as, as most of you know, this this just came out a few, uh, few days ago, a month or so ago. And it's one of the poems I wanted to talk about in terms of a general understanding of the indigenous world. And I started in the Andes, the the, the the concerning the henbane bird and the, uh, the, the second poem on, the, on Africa. And uh, this is, this is the, the, uh, the third poem is on uh, the uh, Ganges. And uh, this is indigenous spectrum across the waters. And uh, you, I wanna understand how, how all these things connect because if you go into outer space, all these things, <laughs> Even, even enemies have to admit that they, they're, they're connecting. <laughs> but, you know, all we have, have is, is terrestrial reportage, you know, which, which, which gives us a skewed view. So 
what I'm going to do is, is give uh, an attempt at the reading of this, this work. By the way, when I do work and I write books, I really don't get into reading them. <laughs> so I'm not practiced on sometimes on my own craft here, but I, I'm, I'm onto something new all the time. Not, not in a superficial way, but that's the way it works for me. And uh, this is about an untouched, the voice of an untouchable. And uh, he says, I've come to these waters as Shudra, as hallucinated Lama, as spellbinding diktat. In this regard, I am not a Mahatma, nor a spurious, spurious, spurious intrusion singing in mystical parlando. Me, I'm an old Dravidian from Goa, spectral, velvet, discussing motions concusses with sand, discussing the body as a vernix riddle or a poem sourced by cholera, or formations tense with blue rotation of acids. Perhaps I'm not more than a ghost or a villainous discovery or a gameless instigation based on a set of rivalries with absence. Perhaps I've come to these waters to call, to craft my own tremendiums, to walk outside Numunion, to blur my trans identity through culture, perhaps this is how blood works, how audition reacts and stages itself through collective physical conflagrations. Have I come to view to simply foil myself or to ignite my force by regressive combining? As I react and speak as I react, I've come to hover at the gaps, the color of a psychic kashi, sometimes sable and liquid, at others, sulfurino and volcanic. As I respond through parallel, as persona, there's Benares, Varanasi, and Kashi. Kashi all once again, if, as if synergies were overactive with Agua. As Buddhist, as Dravidian from Goa, there is English voice mixed in Kannada, Hindu, Agua, plagued in the depths, then exploding as unparalleled power as in the purity of ravens. And I see boats burn beneath an unstable sun. Gats waver as strange proportional richters, as ciphered monsoon epics, as blank emission misfocused. And so the Maharaja's walls take on a cunning electrical rate as collapsing body self moored to an unsteady balance. I am different. I make no offspring of dry flowers or make is my form philosophical unraveling to evince a kind of portion forced from the gullet as mountainous prayer. Perhaps firewood on the gats, perhaps corpses piled in as conflagration in, in and audio, and perhaps my heresy of claim is more than entranced moaning, more than something beyond intransigent chakras. For instance, my psyche swims through neglected altar currents, as if I'd stumbled on a feast of vermin, on infested sugar hamlets. And for those who declare themselves through samsara, I've risen to no more than the status of a goral or a panger, or that at best, I've lived a million times and never subsist as purposeful vahana. I've never sat in posture chewing on chana or invaded a dharmasala, speaking quietly to myself through emulated frenzy. When letters burn, when rocks fly in from the heavens, they are signs of bats and thistles, that kinetics internally stung by solar incandescence, these being kinetics, being the Varuna and the Ashi, as if I were speaking a liminal Varanasi, felt and brought to life again by rays from the great Surya, from solar form as shard, as com cosmic spiral, as situational treatise, as looking glass spawned from complexification and sulfur, therefore listening to suns as scorching indigo and silver. 
What I'm able to do is to translate, is to merge samsara with gat after gat, yet all the while bared from the crypto brahmanical Ah, but I know the very summoning of phenomena and the Ganges reacts as luminescence through nothingness. Through a spell of transverse murmurs, calling and taking away the purest patterns of breathing, being colorless amethyst, which emboldens itself through rotational flooding. Errors are seemingly embodied and drained, yet what has always concurred is the body is wooden abandonment as exhausted coronation, a sensate stain through providential inversion. So if I pick out points in time, it creates no ultimate significance. And if on such inscrutable date, a certain sari was stolen, if peculiar yaks were transmogrified, Life could build as no other outcome, being nothing to itself, being energy randomly exchanged as say tsunamis in Lisbon. So nothing would burn at that hour. Therefore the listless feuds, the pointless tiger cats prowling, lit by curved and tattooed lightning. These are fires which create of themselves riddles imposed and superimposed so that in the shape of the being, no structure exists. No animal can live or be brought back from thinking. If vultures crawl and exhibit no response, I call them naked, fraught with competitive create cremations. And there must exist from this a flicker of understanding within the fuels which considered transgression, much in the manner of the torment of owls or hornets which gather affliction and then revert in themselves to a scorched or empty preludial. This is how hawks grow empty of their optimums, of the twist of the writhing nature in their bones. At times I make sport of riveting, rivaling certain bodies immobilized on a curiously saddled sheep or taking codes from Mongolian ponies, transposing in my sleep sudden errors of waking, not that I can test my own substance as law, but that I've reached an effortless fissure that brought thoughts from certain gods that can't bury themselves. Because I've lost my thirst for the heralded soma or for the image of myself that nothingness can inspire, perhaps the rats condone me as vapor or a scent which kindles venoms or encircles itself with envy. As if I tangled myself with sounds with unsuspected clauses with rifts in the notes of cyclones. As if I had captured dust from fractured tidal heating. As if my strange basaltic waters hollowed their way through captured foundations as lighted prowls, as blazeless forts, as mono monomial stealths and tension not that these wastes are cold Tellurian rapids, but that they exist as forms of forms peculiar and mixed with Cornelian, as heightened waves delimited and sterile with friction. Because beings exist, they descend from gat after gat. They descend as moral plesiosaurs in crisis, as those who emote by proportional stain. I cannot say that the Ganges creates no suffusion or that it has no effect on birth or that it doesn't provoke human insular navigation. I am saying this is the water of not summoning or has never existed. That is a more mineral with, with worth that has not blossomed beyond the music of the Vedas beyond its stones of sacred writings. This water perhaps fumes from a stored up sun or from a moon which has fallen from itself as response to halos seized an ironical limit as Lama. Do I seek to extract from these waters the flow of Tibetan sound or to give them the means to work through proportional tenant? Because 
I'm anonymous on the gat. I'm never seen as alien. Splashing is impure waters, nor am I seen as witness according to astrologies posed as they are against dominance and dominance and forgetting. For call the Ganges a lake of therapeutics or an unrivaled bellow or too entangled with stricture, let me say, I do not spite its rivers or seek to denigrate its form or its birth in regions which erupt from the senses of mountainous parturition. For me, the Himalayas whirls and carry no structured pitch or static inference because I've flown from their climates and known their assignations, their riddles, the conditions which substantiate a fulminant or sacred subspecies. Saying this, I wear no rivalrous wool. I station none of my lore within the source of Tibetan conflict. As ghost, as Shudra, as Nilotic and Sino-Tibetan, I know bold and progressive detail. I know that perniciousness extends and shifts continent to continent through quarrelsome edicts, through perilous in dynamics. The waters blaze its parallel indifference as wandering on a stretch of land gone bad, which seems to, de to divinations that tangle and rainbows merge and travel through peripheries. Both today's hawks de occur, disestablished monsters through bleak or aggressive grammars. This I may say is the Ganges as if there existed no proof, no simple formula or reign for various background calculations. For me, for pilgrims, perhaps verbs burn, perhaps circuitous science seance instructs, perhaps chakras subsist by bold and carnivorous exam. Yet I, as one tested by remoteness, by slurred tendencies through speaking, know the crows which remain in Goa, who signal them to themselves as if appearing as forms on Sirius, as in derived from mana, as involutional ink, as transmogrified embodiment, haunted by shifts which seep from transgressive kingdoms. I don't want to go on too long. By the way, that was my first time really looking at the text. So it can be read for hours and hours, but it was a workout. So I thank you all, all the, all the brilliant souls that have, have brought their spirits to bear on this reading. And uh, thank you again for Dia for having me and for setting this, this momentum ablaze. Thank you, Will, and thanks to all the poets for joining us tonight and for being here.